All right. I'm not going to swear today. Okay. Damn it. No swearing. No swearing, Derek. They will. Someone will. That's what. That's that's what. I sometimes I get com complaints in my reviews about that. I swear too much. I understand it upsets some people. I just don't give a shit. <laughs> no, I do care. I care about you. I know it seems like I'm sarcastic and I don't care, but I do. Uh, okay, so what are we doing? We are doing passing on genes. So last we were together. Um, we uh, talked about, I think we got through the Red Queen theory, we got through gametes, through sex determination, and we stopped at reproductive strategies. Um, we're reviewing some of the ideas that come up in the film. We're going to kind of expand on them and talk a little bit more about some of them. Um, and I'll try to make sure that you grasp all the important examples from the film, even if I don't bring it up in this lecture by the end of today. So... Um, in the film, the film makes the point, this is the Y Sex movie, which if you missed is over in Social Sciences Learning Center, as are all of my films, um, makes the point that males and females pursue different reproductive strategies. How? Do you remember? Yes. Okay, and what's going to happen in the mating game? Males sow their oats. What about females? The competition is between whom? Males. So what do females do? Do they have to compete with each other for mates? No, because the males are knocking on their door, baby. You don't have to do anything but sit there and wait. And then when the males come, what happens? Well, if your species is one where the male doesn't have control over a group of females, this happens too, if the male has control over a group of females, then the females don't have any choice because that male is going to chase every other male away, right? But if it's a situation where males are going to compete for females and a female will have access to more than a single male, then she does what? Chooses, right? Do you remember whose research on female choice was the first that took place after Darwin or what it was about? About the peacocks, right? It was Marion Petrie's uh, research on peacocks, on female choice. And what did that research show? Okay, so a couple of things. Size matters. Everyone always remembers size matters, right? It's like, it's, it's, you know why you remember that? Because it confirms what you already think. <laughs> that's right. That's bad science. You're supposed to have an open mind toward your different hypotheses and not look for things that confirm the way you already think. Uh, I should have said that. Uh, other things the film, other things that her research found about peacocks. There's several things they mentioned. Okay. So she cuts down the tail and then she cuts off the eye spots and both times result in the same thing, which is the lonely mating season for the trim birds. When you say size matters, what does that mean? Can we convert that to an explanation? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it, it means that the bird is actually more desirable as a mate. That is to say, it's healthier because it requires, you know, greater resources to grow those things. But also, you know, if you think about it, the female that mates with the males of the biggest tails, who, you know, all the females have this preference, so they all go for that male. But that also means that their offspring, their male offspring, will have that same trait and ultimately be desirable to females in that generation. So basically, for peacocks, it pays off to have sexy sons. If you think about the fitness of the female, the fitness of the female is increased if her sons are sexy, basically. So it's, it's, her choice impacts her own fitness. Um, and, and this is the interesting thing that sort of happens. But basically the difference is, is that males are looking 
for quantity over quality. Females are looking for quality over quantity and therefore are choosier. Okay, and here's some of those bullet points um, to start. So if you can start chatting. And you can, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What was, did you have a question or a point? Um, what if the tails hinder them from being more likely to survive because they use more of their resources to have the tail? And it makes them obvious to predators and all this stuff, right? Wouldn't that be evolutionary or wouldn't that be like unsuccessful? A disadvantage? Yeah, yeah totally. And it's a trade off. So one of the things that keeps birds' tails and bright feathers and all that stuff from just getting bigger and bigger and bigger forever is the fact that there is a disadvantage. The advantage, the advantage that, that makes it happen at all is this payoff in mating. But the trade-off is, is that you're more vulnerable in other respects, right? So the peacock's a pretty big bird. It, does, it is capable of flying, which a lot of people don't know until they see my video because they don't tend to fly. It takes too much work. So it doesn't have a lot of natural predators. So, you know, if it were smaller, it might have more natural predators, and that might prevent this from happening. But it really, the ability to fly is sort of critical, and that's why you find these kind of elaborate male displays among birds oftentimes, because the disadvantage that being brightly colored or having a really long tail gives you with respect to f predators is offset by the power of flight, which gives you a really big advantage against other predators, right? Except other birds. It gives advantage against predators, but not so much other birds. So reproductive strategies work like this. Different reproductive strategies increase fitness for males and females. This is especially true among mammals. So males will aim to maximize reproductive success through frequent matings quantity over quality. Females invest more in offspring and are choosier, quality over quantity. Okay? Understanding these two bullet points is absolutely critical. Um, why is this especially true among mammals? I say that, but I didn't explain it. Why is it especially true among mammals? Sorry, Andrew. Okay, so that means that females need to be choosier. Is that a hand? That's, that's, a t that's the tiniest hand raise I've ever seen. It was almost like a finger. <laughs> yeah, it's related to that. And because they have fewer offspring, that means what are females doing? Well, why are, why are mammal females going to be choosier than, say, females in some other groups, like spiders or something? Mm, that's only true of some species. That's unusual. They, they usually have less offspring because they only have a certain amount of eggs. Yeah, and they have less offspring because it's so much work. The answer to the question of why female mammals are choosier is because they're working their asses off, ladies. Just remember that, okay? Listen. If you don't have kids yet, you're going to find out the hard way. They're a lot of work. Okay? And I don't even have any, and I know that. You know that, too. Um, so for mammals, the, especially for females, there's so much investment in the young. It goes way beyond just carrying the young, which that's a lot of biological investment, too. Christ, my trainer's been pregnant. I'm going to her baby shower next month. Uh, but can, I, can I just recommend that you never actually train at a gym with a pregnant woman because she's, like, she's some sort of, like, you know... Black widow spider or something, <laughs> um, but yeah. So I mean, it's a. I mean, pregnancy, man. That's that's a huge deal biologically. That's a lot of resources for for the female body. It's a big demand on the female body. Sometimes it even poses a threat to the mother, right? Like you know, diabetes and things like that. But that's not the only one. Um, so that's a huge commitment. That huge commitment is going to be reflected in how choosy females are. If females didn't invest a lot in the offspring, they wouldn't be so choosy, right? That's really what it's about. The males invest less, so they're not as choosy. So that means if you have a species like a spider where the female isn't really doing that much work, she's not going to care quite as much as she would if she was a person, okay? Lots of lessons that you can draw for your life from this part of this class, <laughs> girls. And one of them is that you should be choosy, okay? There's even songs about this, right? 
Don't fall for the very first guy. Hold on, yeah, there's also statistics. Don't don't be don't be don't be a female that makes bad choices. God, how many friends do I have like this? Women with their with male troubles. And it's you know what it is, you know what it always is, you want some advice. Uncle Derek's gonna give you some advice now, kids. It's always the girls that like the bad boys. And this relates to the film as well. Remember the thing about female choice of mates at the end with the evolutionary psychology and the scrolling face, the research on the computer with the scrolling face? And which one do you think is the most attractive male? Right? What was that research about? Yeah. You're not, you're warm, you're not quite right. It's not the age of the participant that determined it. Do you remember? It was the, it was the, based on their cycle, their, uh, their, like, their period, their, like, their menstruation. Yeah, when they were ovulating, they, there was a change to what type of, of ideal? Uh, when it's softer, more warmer. No, uh, the, the more masculine, testosterone shows, uh -huh. because that's when you want the good genes, is when you could get pregnant. Right, so that's when, like the songbirds, and there actually is a study that shows us that women are more likely to cheat when they're ovulating, even though they may not—they're not—they may not even be aware of that this is actually happening, right? Because the interesting thing about females, one of the differences, female humans, and one of the differences between us and say chimps and a lot of other primates is, is that we have concealed ovulation, right? So when chimps, you might have noticed in the film that when chimp females are in estrus, their butts swell up and turn red, which is pretty much like a big neon sign saying, mate with me, right? I mean, imagine, like as if women don't have enough trouble already. Imagine if your butt doubled in size and turned red every time you were ovulating. I mean, God, that would suck. Um, <laughs> So, so there are some things that be about being human that are that are that are pretty good. Uh, concealed ovulation is one of them. So, not, women aren't might not even be necessarily aware of this, and they weren't aware that in the study that they were responding differently. But when that's happening, and they're most likely to be pregnant, they're looking for the good genes, and therefore looking to cheat, um, as it were. Um, uh, so that's what happens. You get that shift. But in general, they're you know. Humans, like songbirds, need to have bonded pair relationships where both parents contribute to the offspring because our offspring are so helpless. So we have monogamy, which is an unusual arrangement. Okay, So that means that females need not just to find good genes, but also to find a mate that sort of sticks around that will help her. Okay. Now, the study is kind of simplistic, but the, one of the points that's made by Meredith Small in the film is, is that evolutionary psychology has a lot of interesting ideas, and they focus on things like sex and mate choice, so people always find it interesting. It's a common topic for your re final research paper in this class. Uh, but they sometimes make sort of simplistic uh, conclusions about things. If you think about it, right? You know, does a testosterone-charged face of a very masculine male mean that that male has better genes? Definitely. Not necessarily, right? So there might be a little problem there. There's kind of an assumption there in this research. The other thing is, is that just because a guy has that sort of masculine testosterone look, doesn't mean that he's not going to be a devoted mate, does it? It's not automatically that a guy that looks like that isn't going to stand by you or be a good husband, right? Nor for that matter, I mean, w nor for that matter can you actually construct a simplistic dichotomy between this masculine testosterone face and this kinder, gentler person that's going to stand by you because they love you. Like, you know, let me walk around the room here for a few minutes and I'll just hold my hand over several selected males, and you can, you can vote as to whether or not they are testosterone-charged sex pots or kinder, gentler guys that'll stand by you and your kid. I mean, are you really going to be able to deduce this by looking at someone's face? So they're, they're, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than some of this research allows, but it is interesting and provocative, as Meredith Small says. Yeah. You'd want to test it cross-culturally, definitely, and that's another problem. There is something social that I believe in raised like 
Right, absolutely. There's, there's, there's a great deal of cultural variation in terms of what people in different societies find attractive. I mean, even like body types are not completely consistent. In many societies, being heavy is attractive. In our society, we have this sort of mania for, for being thin, right? And that's not consistent. So culture and cultural preferences and values is a complicated variable that evolutionary psychology has historically had had difficulty really sort of addressing in a satisfactory way. A lot of cultural anthropologists are quite critical of evolutionary psychology, um, but it sells because people are always interested in reading things about, about sex and that kind of thing. And there is something to it. I mean, there's a lot of human behavior does seem to to sort of fit with what we know about human evolution. I mean, there is a relationship there, but we're also humans, and we have complex societies and culture and higher thought and, you know, lots of variety in terms of what people like and what people look like and where people grow up and all this kind of thing. So you have to be a little bit careful about oversimplifying, which is sometimes a problem with evolutionary psychology. Okay. Um, all right, so that's that's a good a good momentary digression. But you can certainly learn a lot from the natural world in terms of uh, lessons for leading your life. For example, again, ladies, it's Ladies' Day today. Um, bonobos and chimps. Bonobos and chimps have some valuable lessons for women. Uh, what's the deal? What was the difference in the film? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well they made it with everybody, so but but in terms of how they're how they're how they're treated and their sort of in some sense status in the dominance hierarchy, life isn't so good for chimps. Bonobos we contrast with that. Things are better with bonobos. Why is the question? Females make alliances in the, among bonobos, and they're able to do it because. Yeah, but what was it related to? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's the availability of resources. If your resources are more dispersed, the females can't stay in the vicinity of each other, and they have to disperse to get their resources, so they can't form the bonds. Right. If the food's available to you and females can bond together, then this is something that will help them in terms of having more equal status with males, which, who, who remember, are bigger than they are. This is the, the sort of critical factor is that males are larger than females, so that enables them physically to dominate the females. Of course, this is something that's similar to our own species. Right. So the lesson here is that you should bond with other females in order to to protect your interests, which is actually something that a lot of human females, in fact, do. Um, so there you go. That's, that's, that's your advice from Bonobos. Do you remember what they said was the reason this happened, historically? Why are the two environments different? They were separated by the Congo, I think, the Congo River, and uh, they figured that the gorillas lived where the Bonobos were, and then there was a drought, and all the gorillas died out, but the Bonobos lived to make <laughs> Right. And then when the flood, you know, when the rains came, there were no gorillas, but bonobos kind of filled their niche. And that enabled them to have more resources available. And the, among the chimpanzees, wherever they live, there's also gorillas present. That means that they have to disperse, disperse more for resources. So the gorillas' presence is the critical thing, and it seems to have been the result of this drought. It's the, the difference is the result of the drought. Okay? Good. You guys have a good memory. That's nice. Um, okay. So... The final point here that's critical is, is that the different reproductive strategies of the different sexes can produce differences in behavior and in morphology. Okay. Morphology is traits, features, anatomical differences, if you want to think of it that way. And it can also mean that the interests of the sexes can be in conflict within one another, even within the same species. I mean, and sometimes this conflict is quite, quite pronounced and shocking, right? So you have, for example, um, 
a number of documented examples among orangutans, which are a highly dimorphic species, meaning the males are significantly larger than females, um, of males actually raping females. Like, they will catch them and force them to have sex because they're large enough to do it. And in fact, it's sadly surprising how often rape happens in the natural world. When, in species, of course, where males and females have differences in size, and females are bigger, okay? Which males being bigger than females is the normal pattern among mammals. There's some exceptions to this. In other species, like fish, sometimes the females are significantly larger. It really depends on the species, but orangutans are highly dimorphic. The males are over double the size of the females, and that puts females at a bit of a disadvantage. And in fact, females, when they're mating among orangutans, they just, they just want to mate and get the hell out of there. They, they want to get away from the male as fast as they can, and they pretty much wake up really early in the morning, right? Another lesson for dating. You wake up early in the morning and you slip out of the house and you get away because that male is trouble for you as a female, you know. And, and so male and female orangutans do not stay together. They don't pair bond. Female raises the young, the male just kind of defends the territory. She goes off on her own to get away from him. The main reason isn't that, you know, the, this rape thing is really necessarily so horrible from an evolutionary perspective, right? Of course, if, in terms of humans, it's horrible. But the real problem is, is that because he's so much bigger than her, he gets all the resources. It's the same problem as with the chimps. And, you know, the resource availability in the region where orangutans live is not great. They have to work to get their food a bit. And that puts the female at a disadvantage. So what she wants to do is get away from the male and go forage on her own. And that way she can eat and do her own thing with the kid. And she doesn't have to compete with the male if they're together. So they're solitary creatures. The, the, the couples don't even stay together after they mate, which is obviously different than human beings. Okay, so sexual selection. This leads us to sexual selection which we define as a type of natural selection that acts differently on each sex. Uh, intersexual selection occurs between sexes. Generally, this is females choosing males. And intrasexual selection occurs within one sex, and this usually is referring to males competing with each other. Incidentally, one thing that they didn't tell you about peacocks is that the peacock's tail doesn't only actually function as a way to impress females. It actually functions as a defensive mechanism as well and a way you can intimidate rivals. And interestingly, when you look at the natural world, a lot of the traits that females find attractive are also the same traits that males use as weapons. So females like a bigger male. Well, being bigger is good vis-a-vis -vis your competition with other males. Females go for the male with the big antlers. Well, the big antlers are an advantage in your competition with other males. So those features that females find attractive are actually oftentimes the same as the features that give males an advantage in their intrasexual competition. Right? And that's true of peacock tails. They use them to intimidate each other and to scare away predators, as well as to simply impress females. It does all of that stuff. It's sort of like going to the gym for a guy. I mean, it is. It's all, all of these kinds of comparisons are simplistic, but they help us to understand. You know, Ultimately, people are always going to be more complex, but you can draw certain analogies with humans in the natural world that are quite interesting. Of course, Jeffrey Miller says it's really not so much about whether you go to the gym. It's really all about your brain. Right. For Jeffrey Miller, the brain is the human peacock tail, which is kind of a very interesting idea. It's sort of nice. I like it. That, you know, of course you're going to pick mates by how attractive they are, but in a species that's got highly evolved intelligence and where pair bonding is required for raising an offspring, because our offspring are so helpless, having a smart mate is significant, is important. Okay, and that's important for both males and females. So not surprisingly, since we're pair bonding, we're going to be looking for that in each other. And that ultimately over evolutionary time is going to increase human intelligence because it'll be, that trait will be rewarded by natural selection as we learned that model.
right? And that's Miller's idea about, because this question of how big, how did the brain get so big and how did we get so smart is actually one of the most important questions about human evolution, because it's quite odd, right? It's a very unusual feature, the brain. Recent phenomenon. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a recent phenomenon. It's true, but it's not something that would historically have been the case. Yeah. It's all about industrial society and education and all this stuff that's all happened in the last five minutes, quote unquote, in an evolutionary sense. Yes, you're right, but over, over the long haul, the bigger brain would have been desirable. Okay, sexual dimorphism are sex-specific differences, including body size and weaponry, things like tusks, antlers, and horns. Here is a fish that lives at the bottom of Lake Tanganyika. It's called Neolamprologus calypterus, and it has a fascinating mating ritual. First, let me draw your attention to uh, the fact that this photograph actually includes a male and female pair. This is the male, who's quite a bit larger. This tiny little fish here, which you can barely see because she camouflages quite well, there's her eye spot right there, is the female. She's partially cut off in the picture. Okay, And this is an adult female, and this is an adult male. They are the most dimorphic freshwater fish alive. Okay, And what happens in their little mating routine is, is that she hides out in these little snail shells where she lays her eggs and fans them to make sure they hatch effectively, while he circles overhead and protects the little shell from other males, generally speaking, as well as potentially predators. Now, a very successful male is actually going to have not just one female in a little shell, but several females in a little shell. Because when he's not worried about defending his first female, what he's going to do is swim over to some other guy's territory and try to take him down. Okay, And that's why big males are an advantage. So if he can defeat the other male, what he does is he picks up the other male's little shells and brings them back to his house. And then those females will mate with him and he'll have more offspring that way. So natural selection favors large males, but it doesn't favor large females because they have to fit in this little shell and there's no advantage for them to get big anyway because they don't have any kind of competition for mates. That's a male thing. Okay, It's a beautiful system. Females are choosier. Here's a famous cover of Vanity Fair. It probably came out, what year were you guys born? 82? How about, anybody born in the 90s in here? 90, 90. okay. This came out in 91. And you, you probably know who she is now because she's married to Ashton Kutcher, right? It's Demi Moore. Do you know who that is? Okay. This was, picture was taken a long time ago when, before they got married, she was pregnant with Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, but she could have been. Um, in any case, uh, females are choosier because look how much investment pregnancy involves. The reproductive of a potential of a species, that is to say its survival, lies with its females. Females invest more in their offspring, and this is especially true of mammals, where offspring develop within the body of the female, and females lactate after birth. Postpartum is the term for that. We've actually reviewed all of this, but by putting it on the slide, we'll make sure you've got it in your notes. I think we've actually gone over this a couple times, in fact. If only I was aging as well as Demi Moore. But then, you know, dating Ashton Kutcher probably helps. He doesn't return my phone calls, however. <laughs> Maybe plastic surgery would help, too. Or just being rich. Not teaching at PCC. This job has aged me 50 years. I'll show you a picture of me when I started teaching here, which was only eight years ago. It's amazing. I had a little gray hair then. 
I wish I got my grandma. <laughs> Oh well. This is a long-winded way of saying females are more bi biologically important. We can't live without males, don't get me wrong, but you need females more in terms of the survival of a population. It's an interesting question from an evolutionary perspective, why we don't have a greater sex imbalance, why species, more species, and there are some who have this, but why more species have not evolved a sex imbalance, because males aren't as necessary, so why not have fewer of them? Why not have a species where you have more female offspring. It seems like that would be a great advantage, right? It's an interesting question. There's a literature on that. In species in general, why do, why do you have sort of close to a 50-50 balance of the sexes when ultimately due to the gametic differences, males aren't as valuable? This has been an interesting puzzle for evolutionary theorists, actually. Um, I direct you to The Red Queen by Matt Ridley if you'd like to investigate the question in more detail. It's a very good book. Males are the weaker sex. We are more expendable biologically. We, make, we do little or no parental care among almost all mammal species. Humans are an exception to this, though I will say that we offer less parental care than women in all human societies. Okay. It's, it's, we're catching up, though, especially in industrialized societies now, because sometimes both parents don't work. One parent's not working for a while. You've got stay-at-home dads. You have active fathers like my brother. My brother and sister-in-law do very close to the same amount of work for the kids. But my sister-in-law still has to do all the cooking. She still has more work. Which is better for all of us, because my brother's cooking is pretty bad. Men die younger in all societies, an average of six to eight years. So all that work's going to pay off, ladies. You get rid of us eventually. We're more prone to risk-taking behaviors, which evolutionary theory explains as a way that we impress mates. Males, especially young males like yourself, and here's the lesson for you guys, engage in risky behaviors. You're in the highest demographic for risk-taking behaviors. That's why your car insurance is so expensive. Don't ever trust a male. Don't ever trust a 20-year-old male. Totally unstable. Why are they doing it? Well, because, you know, if they get on a motorcycle and race around a track at 130 miles an hour, girls just love that. Of course, usually there are less risky ways to impress women. Um, buying a guitar is better, actually. I don't know what it is about the guitar thing, but... <laughs> it's like the songbird model, right? Get a guitar, sing a song. You know, that's why every guy's dream is to be in a rock band. I won't even ask how many people, how many men in this room are in a band. Actually, let's ask how many men in this room are in a band, honestly. None? A oh, one. Fine. Be proud, dude. <laughs> Excellent. Good for you. Your stock just went way up. <laughs> Unless you play the drums. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> drums. Love the drums. Drummers take so much shit. <sighs> See? Maybe that's all your, you guys, that's your problem, guys. You're getting a band. You're wasting your time getting an education. You gotta drop out of this class and get in a rock band. <laughs> Jesus, how many times do I have to tell you? 90%, here's the good news. <laughs> well, maybe it's not so good. It's not so good for 10% of you. 90% of males, of human males, do find a mate at some point in their life. And if you think about it, the male reproductive strategy is about finding a mate. Not necessarily long term, but about finding a mate. I think it's, I don't think it's reproducing in the modern human world because contraception and all of that. 
So finding mate, I think, would probably be, I don't know if it means that you lose your virginity. You know, that's a good question, actually. Maybe it probably means that. Monogamy is a very unusual reproductive strategy. It happens among songbirds. Our closest relative that it happens amongst are gibbons, which are shown in this picture, and you'll see them when we go to the Gibbon Center, which is actually coming up. That's in October, that trip. I'll have a flyer for you next week. Uh, it occurs where both parents must support the offspring. It's very rare among mammals. Monogamous species are not usually dimorphic. Okay? What does that mean? Well, it means that males and females are the same size. Why would that be? Well, think of Neolamprologus calypterus. The reason why he's big is so he can go out and conquer other males and get more female mates. If that doesn't happen in your species, everybody pairs off together, then there's not that kind of competition. That doesn't drive males to get bigger and bigger. So for gibbons, males and females are about the same size. Now what happens with gibbons is that males will be black and females will be white, or vice versa. So you have color differences between males and females. And that's actually useful because if males and females are exactly the same, and you've got your genitalia hidden away in your fur, as gibbons do, that black and white coloring lets you know pretty quickly and easily who your potential mates are. We call that difference not dimorphism, but dichromatism. So dichromatism means different colors. Monogamy rarely occurs for life and reality. As the film sort of showed you, cheating is something that is favored by natural selection because in a monogamous group, if you marry, that is to say marry, but if you mate with one individual, then you know, you're, and you're with that person, that, that individual, if you're not a human, for life, and that individual is a dud, then you're not going to reproduce effectively. So for males, sowing oats, as we say, or pursuing a reproductive strategy where they maximize quantity over quality drives them to cheat. And it's a stronger selection pressure on males to do so, but there's still a selection pressure on females to cheat as well because they never know. Their husband might be a dud or there might be a better male out there. And the good thing about being a female among most species is that males are knocking at your door, so usually cheating is pretty easy. Because of that, males go through what's called mate guarding. If two members of a species, a male and female, bond together, they will watch each other closely and sometimes stay together all the time like lovebirds. People do this too. If you're wealthy enough, you can hire a private investigator and have your wife followed. <laughs> Otherwise, you might have to follow her yourself. Can't follow her too much because that makes you a stalker, but the bottom line is that we all have a little bit of stalker in us, no matter who you are. Okay? If you don't have a stalker within, you're probably not normal. <laughs> All right, bird monogamy. Um, is monogamy is most common in birds. Natural selection still favors cheating by both partners. The result is mate guarding. Some of this repeats the information I just gave you. Uh, and you don't have to write down the last bullet. Well, maybe the yellow bullet, but not the numbers. Don't worry about the numbers. Um, but basically, as the film told you, genetic testing shows uh, that offspring often result from extra pair matings, and the percentage varies. So cardinal 7%, blackbirds 28%, indigo buntings 38%, tree swallows up to 50 So birds, you see, this is a really shocking result when genetic testing came into the picture because people who studied birds, um, partly because you can't follow birds easily because they can fly, always thought that birds were kind of like this model of monogamy and fidelity, but it turns out they're cheating like way more than even the bird experts ever thought. This was a bit of a surprise. And I'm afraid the place of pair bonded birds as a symbol of monogamous love has been tainted by studies that show they're just cheating on each other right and left. Sad fact, actually. 
So monogamous species usually do what's called serial monogamy, which you have a series of relationships with different individuals, and they last for a period of time. Humans actually fit this pattern as well. Humans don't typically stick with one mate throughout their lifetime. Sometimes your society will tell you that's an ideal, like you should do that. My parents have been married for 55 years, and everyone thinks it's really cute. Um, they are, too. They're, like, still in love after all that time, um, which is really kind of annoying because I can't. my relationship lasts about 20 minutes uh, <laughs> on average. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, you know, that's an ideal, but the reality is that most people go through a series of mates. Some of them you may not be married to, but you have a series of mates in your life. And actually, divorce is actually the norm. Most people get divorced now in our society. So, human mating systems go like this. Human infants are born unusually premature. They, de they develop after birth. Monogamy is the norm. Cheating and divorce are common. That is to say, we practice serial monogamy. But interestingly, you find men with multiple wives. The word for this is polygyny. Um, most people are familiar with this word, which is polygamy. And polygamy just means multiple partners. It comes in two forms. One is polyandry, which is a female with multiple husbands. But the far more common pattern, which you're more familiar with, is a male with multiple wives. And that's called polygyny. Poly means many, giant means female. So polygyny is found in 80% of all the societies documented. It's not found among the majority of men in those societies, because generally speaking, you run out of women. Unless your society kills a large percentage of its males, this is what happens. So if you have a sex imbalance where there are relatively few males and males control the wealth, then females need to marry a male because of the economic control that males have, and that means a lot. the men will typically have more than a single wife. But if the sex balances are equal, then it's only a few men who might have a lot of wealth or resources or status or whatnot that have more than a single wife. But the point here is, is that in 80% of all the societies documented, at least some polygyny actually occurs. Okay, So it seems to be something that's pretty normal for human beings, actually. It's not the most common arrangement. That's monogamy. But it occurs frequently enough that there seems to be something going on with that. You know what? What happened here? There's a couple of more slides I need to show you that weren't in this presentation. Should we go back? To, I'm sorry, you probably didn't get all the information on the last one. I was kind of curious how we ended up in that. But I've, I've got I've to show you a few more slides here about, about the different reproductive strategies of males and females. But wait, I'm not done. A little bit more to talk about before we go on and talk about Mendel. Mendel's our next task after sex when we talk about inheritance, which is related. This is a medieval painting of a guy finding out that his wife's cheating on him. <laughs> it's hard pressed for an illustration. Yes. The second, this one here. That's polandry, P-O-L-Y-A-N-D-R-Y. And again, that means a wife with a woman with multiple husbands. It's very rare, naturally. Only a few societies practice it. Men have multiple wives much more commonly than women have multiple husbands. I brought this up to my cultural anthropology class one year, and a woman raised her hand. She said, I would never want more than one husband. The one I've got is bad enough. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 
Let me find those slides. I know they're here somewhere. Uh, wow, it's not there. That's bizarre. Extra short line, yeah. Passing on jeans. Oh, here we go. He's doing the short one. That's why. Ha ha. All right. Sexual dimorphism. We talked about this. This is what I want to talk about next. Male competition in the natural world comes in four forms. Competition number one is conflict, such as these two fighting elephant seals. Elephant seal fighting is really cool. It's sort of like sumo wrestling with biting. <laughs> so they sort of like body slam each other and then try to bite each other. And that's why they all have those scar marks that are pink from having fighting with each other. Now male competition, that is to say conflict, is most intense in species that have harem social group like elephant seals. What does that mean, a harem social group? What does that mean? What's the word on the board that means a harem social group? Polygyny. This one here. One male, multiple females. So you get a situation like this. I always love drawing on the board. You get this big, badass guy. All right, and this is the male. Could be elephant seals, could be anything. Could be Neolamprologus, Calypterus, whatever. Then you got a harem of females. Okay, now in the case of elephant seals, the females lie around the beach all the time. Of course, they have to nurse the offspring, but life's pretty good. They don't have any conflict with each other. No one bothers them too much. They get to lie on the beach a lot. They have to go out and get their food and swim and get the fish and all that kind of thing. Meanwhile, this male, who we call the alpha, is doing everything he can to defend these females that he controls, right? In this situation, he's controlling this group of females against other males, right? So, if you think about it in terms of reproductive success, these different females, right, are probably assuming that they're biologically fine, having about the same number of offspring, one a year, right? So they all have reproductive success that's equal to each other, right? Not so with the males. The male who's the alpha, who controls the, whatever you want to call it, the harem, has great reproductive success, and all the other males that are left out in the cold have none, which means that this is an all-or-nothing game, and that's why battles between males in this, with this type of social situation can be really fierce because there's so much at stake. You're either a nothing from a perspective of, of you know, evolution, you're contributing nothing to the next generation, or you're contributing a lot, and you're willing to risk your life to become this guy. And that's why these battles are so ugly, and they lie around and fight so much, because it's so intense. Now, this male's in a good situation, but the problem is, is that every other male is gunning for him, right? Because they're out there doing nothing. They have two possible strategies, the male. The, other, the rogue males, we could call them. They can either take over the group from a male, or they can try to sneak in and get a quick mating and then rush out before the big bad guy chases them away, which is what he does. He sort of defends the harem against these males that lurk nearby. And at a certain point, the harem becomes so big that one single male is not physically capable of actually defending it. If you look at elephant seals, they're quite fat. I mean, they weigh a ton. They kind of lumber along the beach. They swim better than they, than they, than they move on land. So at a certain point, there's so many females you can't defend them, and that's when the group splits in two, and another male sort of will take the, you know, whatever, the remainder of the group. 
But basically, he's going to defend his group against all of their males at all costs. Now, the problem is everybody's gunning for him, so that means that while he's the leader, while he's the alpha, he's got it really good. He's going to be reproducing really successfully, but his tenure as alpha is going to be short-lived because somebody bigger and badder is going to come along and crush him, and then that's over, and his days are done. So it's an all-or-nothing game for males, and it's short-term, and they need to reproduce as fast as they possibly can. Um, so there's a lot of competition that goes along with this. You don't compete so much when your species is monogamous. All right? When your species is monogamous, if you and another male are interested in the same female, and she's interested in both of you, you might have some kind of conflict, but then you're going to basically go your separate ways. And if she doesn't, she likes him better, you go and you find another female. You've heard the expression, there's lots of fish in the sea. This is how it is with monogamous species, of which we are one. So that means that conflict among males in our social group is actually lower in humans. It's lower. And a lot of the conflict in humans is really just all about show, right? What happens in human-male conflict? Well, a lot of it actually happens in sports, so it's symbolic, it's not real, right? That's part of our conflict works. But even when real conflict happens, what is it usually? Like a couple guys drunk at the bar, you know, and they're sort of wasted, and something happens, and then, and then they get, and it's all talk, right? Sort of puff out your chest and try to look bigger. You know, you want a piece of me? Yeah, come here, man. And then, oh, and then you know, and then everybody sort of like keeps them from fighting and nothing really ever happens, right? Or someone pulls out a gun and shoots someone, right? Which just solves the problem. So, basically, it's a lot of, it's a lot of show in conflict. And that makes sense because you don't, if mating is not an all-or-nothing game for you, then why risk your life, right? That's the thing. It's, you're better off living to mate another day with another partner, and they're available because one male is not monopolizing all the females as they are with elephant seals. So you don't get the same kind of intense competition between males in monogamous species that you do among those with a polygynous or harem social group, okay? Um, Welcome to sociobiology. What we're doing here is making connections between social groups and the evolution of certain traits. So we're looking at the relationship between traits and behaviors, basically, which is something new for us in this class, really. Okay, the next type of male competition we could call display. And this is the path of the peacock. In fact, we could call the first type competition boxing match. And we could call the second type display beauty contest. <laughs> so beauty contest, or the path of the peacock, is when males advertise their good genes through traits and behaviors. Now in this case, the females have more choice. The males aren't monopolizing a group of females, so females have more choice. That means female choice plays a more important role in these species. And females get pretty damn choosy, let me tell you. That peacock's not good enough. That tail's not pretty enough. You're not trying hard enough. You're not singing enough. You're not dancing enough. You're not good enough. Goodbye. <laughs> you, just can't you just can't please some females of certain species. Uh, one of them, interestingly, is the sage grouse. A lot of birds have this, pr uh, this sort of behavior we call lecking which means it really is like a beauty contest. All the males come together during mating season and they land in one little place. It's a mating ground. And they all are there and with these grouse, what they do is this little dance. They kind of cluck, 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 cluck. And they do this thing and they do this dance and all the females kind of sit on the sidelines looking at what's going down and deciding which male is the best male. Okay, and they watch for a while, and the males kind of, you know, they put up with each other, but they're all trying to show off and dance, and then the females pick whoever they think is the prettiest. Now, when you're a person and you're watching this go on, the males all look exactly the same. I mean, you can't tell them apart, but man, can those females tell them apart. And the interesting thing is that they, when they study this, it turns out that this goes on over the course of, of many days. So there's about a week where this is all happening. And females come and go over the course of the week, and they all consistently pick the same individual or perhaps the top two. 
and all these other males that to us look exactly the same are totally left out in the cold. Because the f basically the more elaborate the males display, the better the female's ability to detect the qualities that the display is showing. So female choosiness is, is related to male display. You get this elaborate tail on a peacock, you better believe the female peacocks have it up here as to how to best discern the best male, and they can see that. Okay? So males advertise good genes through traits and behaviors. Females choose mates on the basis of traits. Female preference leads to more and more elaborate male ornamentation or behavior. And female fitness is increased by sons that win this beauty contest, which we refer to as the sexy son hypothesis. Which, I should add, was actually the name of my band in grad school. <laughs> Needless to say, we went nowhere, and that's why I'm teaching school today. But we had a great name. <laughs> Actually, we lasted sort of one drunken night. It wasn't really a serious attempt or anything. I played the tambourine. <laughs> Just kidding. Tambourine is not an impressive instrument for gaining mates. All right. How are we? We good? Everybody stopped writing? All right. Competition number three is provisioning. We could call this candy and flowers. Male bowerbirds, uh, this is like the best, I love bowerbirds, if you've ever seen the, there's a great Attenborough special on bowerbirds, it's awesome. This, uh, they all come from this family called Tylona Ronchidae, don't worry about writing the name down. Basically, I just want you to understand how provisioning works. Provisioning is when males will bring something, resources that the female needs. And uh, this often happens in monogamous pairs because the males in monogamous pairs are going to be providing food to the offspring. So how good a provider the male is matters. We find this in, among humans, too. Interestingly, humans exhibit all of these types of competition. Um, so the bowerbirds are interesting. See, a lot of birds have competitions where the male demonstrates his provisioning abilities by building a nest for the females to live in while she's raising the offspring. And among some birds, nest building has become this incredibly elaborate thing. And it's like lecking, where all the males will build the nest in the same sets of the trees, and then the, male, the females will fly around and look at the nests. And they'll decide, well, you know, that one's not good enough. And they fly over and look at another nest. And they finally pick one that they like. And then they settle down into the nest. The male mates with her. And then he immediately starts building another nest for the next female who might pick him. Right? Now, when he has time, what he does with other males, males being who males are, is, is that he has some free time on his hands. So what he does is he flies on over to the nest of his neighbor and he tears it apart rips it to shreds. That way no female would ever live in there because she's going to fly by and go, oh, what a shitty nest. Who would ever mate with this guy? So the competition becomes one of destroying each other's houses. Okay. Now the most extraordinary type of bird in this regard is, are these bower birds who actually don't even really build nests at all. They build these elaborate structures. This one is the, the satin bower bird, and it builds a structure that's about over four feet across, a little bird's about five inches in size, drags these huge twigs, builds this giant thing, and then it goes and finds brightly colored objects and displays them in piles to impress the girl. Right? It's not even a house. They don't even mate there. As soon as they, she decides she loves him, they fly off, they mate somewhere else, and then she goes and raises the offspring. It's not even a nest. It's an art gallery. It's awesome. So he builds a art gallery for her. He flies all around the forest to find begonia blossoms or the wing cases of beetles or whatever it is, brings them back, and then he arranges them just so to make them look really pretty so she'll be really impressed. And then, of course, also when he has free time on his hands, he flies half a mile away where you'll find the other male bowerbird's bower, and he tears it apart so she won't mate with him. Right? And this all goes on in this kind of maniacal comp competitive cycle. It's good to be a bowerbird. Competition number four is sperm competition. And I don't have a catchy name for this. Orgy? Let's call it orgy. 
So sperm competition is competition around the act of fertilization. Some people call it gametic competition, actually. Um, but basically, it occurs in species where females are promiscuous. And you saw an example of that in the film with the chimpanzees. Remember, the females in, among chimpanzees may with all the males in the group, right? That's what we mean by promiscuity. T typically, promiscuity has like these negative connotations when we use the term, but in biology, it doesn't. It just means the, ma the female mates with a lot of different males. So if that's happening, then the competition occurs at the level of gametes. And that's why Richard Wrangham was saying in the film that chimps have much higher quality sperm than humans because with all the males mating with all the females, then it becomes a question of who has the most high quality sperm. The battle takes place among the gametes. That's where the competition is. And that means that males that produce larger amounts of high quality gametes are favored by natural selection. It's actually not, this is the least important one for human beings, because if you monogamously pair bond, the female isn't mating with a lot of different males. So this one has the least significance for us. Now, some species have, have, have evolved, like, the most elaborate ways of sperm competing. So for damselflies, like the ones shown in the picture, uh, males have a sex organ that's actually shaped like a shovel. And when they have sex with a female and they ejaculate, they will use their shovel-shaped sex organ to remove the sperm of the previous male. And that way they get a one-up on the other males. I swear to God. Some birds will actually, male birds will plug a female up to prevent her from having sex with another, another male. It's crazy what goes on in nature. Crazy. Animal sex is the best thing going, I'm telling you. Uh, natural selection. Yeah, natural selection. Sometimes I'll throw in abbreviations to make your note taking a little bit easier. So that's the fourth type of competition. Now, we're talking a lot about males, and we don't mean to shortchange females because really they're extremely important. And we know that female choice is a driving force of natural selection, even if, as the film maintained, the Victorians had a tough time with this. The female's role in sperm competition, for, for example, is actually more active than you'd think. It sounds like as long as she's mating with a lot of different males, then it pretty much becomes this free-for-all. But there's some interesting things that females have evolved here. One is sperm storage. Lots of reptiles and amphibians can, stir, can store sperm for a really long time. So a female only gets pregnant or fertilizes the egg when resources are available, and that's basically what will trigger it. This is true of a lot of fish, too. I used to sell guppies at the fish store, and um, sometimes I'd have customers that would buy a female guppy, and they wouldn't buy a male and female because they didn't want their five-year-old to watch fish having sex, which is what guppies will do. So, and then they would come back after a couple months and say, my female guppy just gave birth. How is that possible? She's been alone in my fish tank for two months. And I would say, immaculate conception? Uh, no, I would say that, well, it's a funny little thing called sperm competition. Right? Why don't you send your eight-year-old out to play in the traffic while I explain it to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny how many issues between parents and children came up in the fish store job. <laughs> You know, I, we, we opened up at 9 in the morning, and every morning on a Saturday, there'd always be some parent there with a dead goldfish in a bag saying, i got to have one that looks just like this, because I can't let my daughter know that, that Goldie is dead. So we'd go through this big vat of 1,000 goldfish and pick out the one that looked just like hers so that she would never know that Goldie, Goldie's on vacation. Uh, I'm going to go pick Goldie up at school right now, and then you come back with the fish, right? <laughs> Sex and death at the fish store. Uh, the rate of sperm production uh, among males, right? Remember, males produce more gametes. So the rate of sperm production produces a high number of low-quality gametes. There's a lot of misfires in male, uh, male gametic production. That means that the female's body oftentimes evolves as uh, evolves mechanisms by which she, the, the female's body will um, eliminate the sperm that is that is that is poor, so it, it actually treats the sperm as a kind of invasion of the immune. The immune system will attack it 
and seek to destroy it. So only the highest quality sperm can actually fertilize the female's body. This is true for humans. And, it, and you would expect this kind of trait to evolve where female bodies resisted low quality sperm, particularly in species where there was a high investment in the offspring, right? I mean, this is the thing, right? So f not only do you not want your egg fertilized by, by a low quality sperm, it would be to a disadvantage to you. It's not that you want it or don't want it, but you know, because there's so much invested by human females, for example, in offspring, that, that there's a lot at stake there. And in fact, a lot of things can go wrong during embryonic development. We'll talk about this when we get to molecular genetics. But you may be aware that a very large percentage of human females, you know, don't carry their, especially their first uh, pregnancy to term because it doesn't develop properly. So the body will actually, it's, you know, known as spontaneously abort the, uh, the fetus before it comes to, or the embryo is often when it happens. Um, but before it actually, the, the child is carried to term because the development is not going right in a sense. And that's an evolved mechanism as well because you're not going to be investing a lot of your resources in perhaps a baby that won't actually make it or survive, right? Makes sense. Okay, um, where are we? 110, wow, I still got lots of time. I think that's all I have on this today. Yeah. Let's um, start chatting about Mendel. Actually, let me do something really quick here. La, 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 physical syllabi. Let's see where we're at for you and your test. Okay, I have your first exam on 10.3. We are at 9.21 right now. And... I'm going to start Mendel. I can finish Mendel. Okay, let's um, let's take your exam on ten five. Okay, please make that change in your brain or on your syllabus. Um, this will enable me not to have to speed through what is arguably one of the tougher parts of this class at breakneck speed. Um, and um, actually, you know, I think I'll let you go a little bit early today. This isn't a bad place to break, and you've had a lot of information. So why don't I let you guys go um, a little bit early, which never happens. So live it up. <laughs> live it up. Uh, I didn't do roll today again. I'm a bad teacher, but that's the way it goes. And I will see you guys next Monday when we'll start talking about genetics. Oh, I did do roll. I'm sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. My bad. Make sure you're on my roll sheet. If you're not on it, come sign up on your way out. And I will see you guys on Monday. Have a good week and weekend. Yes. Oh. And the shot is for um, so that my body doesn't attack the fetus. Oh, is it really? Yeah. And is that require? Is that really related to your bro, blood type? Bro, yeah. so my, I'm O negative. It's really because you're O negative. Yeah. Wow, O negative is.